something called class reductionism, the idea that there were people out there who were just so blindly socialist and blindly economically fixated that um, they were diminishing, ignoring, or somehow um, uh, denying even uh, the other forms of uh, racism, racism. Uh, gender bias, and other kinds of bigotry in this country. And I, I wondered about that because I don't know any of those people. Uh, and my next guest, who has for many years been a professor studying uh, the intersection of race and politics in this country, has written a, a piece called The Myth of Class Reductionism. Adolf Reed Jr. is uh, very well known in this area. Here are the tropes of Adolf Reed. He denies the existence of class reductionists. He takes on a colorblind approach. He overemphasizes the class struggle as a feature of historical black leaders in the place of black liberation. Reed sees socialism as the solution to all problems. If a problem can't be solved by socialism, then it's not worthy of being solved. Reed deconstructs black politics into two categories, symbolism and a class struggle. For him, racism is just a cover story for class warfare. Everybody uh, sentient at this point, just about, uh, is, is a product at a minimum of the, of the sensibilities, right, around race and gender and sexual orientation, though, ironically, or, or though, I mean, that only t tended to proliferate later, that came out of the new left, right? Um, there's nobody um, except, you know, ha hands full of sectarians or cranks, uh, I mean, someplace, um, who argue that there's no such thing as racism or that race is race and gender are epiphenomenal to building the working class movement right blah 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 uh, but the fact of the matter is i mean the dominant tendencies in left politics now uh have always uh, uh, given uh, i would necessarily say pride of place but have always been conscious of uh, um the dynamics of race and gender that have historically, in some ways, uh, if not um, undercut, at least um, Im impeded, right? I mean, um, um, you know, the struggle to build a left politics in in the U.S. and um, or that race is race and gender are epiphenomenal to the building the working class movement, right? Blah blah blah. Uh, the dynamics of race and gender undercut, impeded left politics in, in the U.S. And, um... Adolf Reed is a hypocrite. He's a class reductionist that uses his black skin to shield himself from claims of being a class reductionist. But that's exactly what he is. He can't help himself. If you listen to him long enough, he will get to a point where he's trying to downplay race and he's trying to make every issue in regards to race about class. I'm asking you to stop. Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording me. Please, please don't stop. come close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to and me. I'm taking pictures and calling the cops. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Excuse me? And Professor 
guys are, you mentioned Amy Cooper, and we covered on the show today that, you know, outrageous moment in the park where she right. is confronted by um, an African-American man named Christian about her having her dog off the leash, and she sort of melts down instantly and says, I'm going to call the police and say an African-American man is threatening me, and then proceeds right. to do exactly that, feigning all kinds of hysterics in the process. I mean, what did you make of that particular moment, and what are the sort of broader implications of it? Uh, okay, I had a few thoughts. One is, I mean, both are, surnames are Cooper, and for all I know, they're related. You know, I think we've reached a point where white people aren't even trying to bullshit us about what we are seeing in these videos anymore. But here goes our brother. He sees that video and these are his first thoughts. This is someone that is supposed to be racially conscious. And this is how he interprets the video. Uh <laughs> That's one thought. Second thought is that she, um, I saw on somebody's Twitter feed and, and I thought about this too, that, uh, I mean, the tweet made a joke of it. I just noted it, that her, that she strained to be politically correct, uh, and call him an African American man. Yeah, that's right. This is all jokes for him. It's all a way to make fun. Of, uh, I guess, uh, political correctness and, like, is that, I don't know, did, did you watch that video? Was that an issue for you as a black person? Did you see that and you think, oh, wow, she called him an African-American? Did that part even stick out to you? Did you really even give a fuck about that part? Were you more concerned about her calling the police to have this man executed? The fuck is this man talking about? What the fuck is wrong with this motherfucker? Oh, but he's not stupid. He knows exactly what we saw. He strained to be politically correct uh, and call him an African-American man <laughs> as you right. call on the cops to come kill him. Call on the cops to come kill him. Cops come kill him. And the third thing is wondering whether she, she should have been disciplined and lost her job for it, and I thought that was kind of interesting too. I mean, nobody's ever gonna ask me to make the decision, so I don't really have to have a serious opinion about it, except um, it strikes me yet again at how um, consistent, maybe as much as anybody um, outside the public sector that's that's not under Republican control anyway, how serious um, you know the leading lights of the financial sector are about their commitments to diversity. It's really extraordinary. I mean. Oh, you thought it was over? Just wait for this shit. It was kind of striking to me that they fired her. I, I mean, if if she'd been a line worker at a poultry plant, I would argue they shouldn't have. It was kind of striking to me that they fired her. If she'd been a line worker at a poultry plant, I would argue they shouldn't have. They shouldn't have. Since she was a management type in an investment banking firm, eh, I couldn't care less. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it was a joke. Then he acknowledged how serious the situation was somewhere in the middle of that joke. And in the conclusion, he comes away with if this woman was, I guess, a, a working class white woman, he would be against firing her. So basically, she set up somebody to be executed and he would have defended her on the basis of working class solidarity from the 30s through the end of the 60s a consistent uh, position on the part well at least ironically after black power a consistent position on the part of um, of of key figures at on the left edge of the civil rights movement was that um a redistributive program um and um um, social or expansion of the social state and expansion of the trade union sector were um, essential uh, sine qua non for um, the advancement of black Americans' rights because black Americans would, for a variety of reasons, disproportionately you know, likely to be workers and poor people and so forth and so on. What were those variety of reasons and why won't you talk about them? That context is very important. And yes, black leaders have pushed for these uh, socialistic, 
positions because they do believe in wealth redistribution and programs for black people. Like, why are you skipping over that part? The part where they all of them have been very specific about black liberation. Very specific about righting the wrongs that have been done to black people. Do what I'm calling radical democracy. Because there's a sense in which I'm building on elements of your earlier work, and I want to know now, later, how you define your sophisticated pan African view of the world with radical democracy. But that kept me in trouble all the time. Because <laughs> I had a 50 year direct relationship right. to the American Communist Party. Right. Right. I would not let them take away my African partiality, my, my nationalism, and I would not let them stop me from criticizing them for their contradiction. Mm -hmm. Until finally they drove me um, out of the association of the party. I was never a member of the party, and yet I was closer related than many members and, and had more confidential information than most members, but I was never actually a member of the party. Briefly, I was a member of the Young Communist League uh, on the Lower East Side, but I read more and did more work and defended the right of the party to exist and traveled in Russia several times and I think the experiment in communism deserves a fair chance to exist. I think the Russians made a mess out of it and turned to capitalism. And Russia is now doing what she, been, what she was criticizing England and the United States and the imperial powers for doing. They're killing our own people. <clears throat> there was some discrimination in Russia against Africans and many Africans and taking Russian women home was found dead on snow piles in Russia. It's interesting to me, as you pointed out, that the demand um, that you hear most often coming from, you know, the sort of uh, black thought leaders that you see on television, that you see online, is that Biden nominate a black VP. And the, the folks that have been offered up most consistently are Stacey Abrams and Kamala Harris, who essentially are ideologically very much in line with Joe Biden. So there's no expectation, yes, personnel is policy, but it doesn't seem to me that there's any expectation that either of those individuals as vice president would change or shape or shift what a Biden administration would ultimately do vis-a-vis -vis the black community. How does that fixation on representation over a policy agenda, how does that impact, how does that ultimately undermine the African-American community? Now, on the face of this, this does appear to be a good question, except for the fact that um, black thought leaders is uh, it's a vast category. And no, this is not the totality of what black thought leaders are pushing for at this point in time. Even Adolph Reed knows that that's not the case uh, but let's see how he deals with this question is he going to expand on black politics to talk about the totality of perspectives or is he going to also minimize black politics and push for a class solution well see that's why i say that the that i'm insisting that the black vote is a fiction right uh, and I would also insist, um, not quite as strongly, but that the notion of the African-American community is, is a similar fiction. And it's a useful fiction. It's a useful fiction. It's a fiction that's useful in the way that all nationalisms are useful, uh, in, in that it functions as a perfume over what's a class-skewed agenda. Um, the, um, again, like the you know, so-called thought leaders, which I think is a very polite and genteel way to put it, um, are, uh, are, are people who have a class investment in this kind of politics, and it's a politics of racial brokerage, and it's got nothing at all to do with the things that the vast majority of black Americans who get up in the morning think about. 
right? Because they get up in the morning thinking about how to pay the mortgage, how to pay the rent. Yep, he denied the existence of the black vote. He denied the existence of a black community and said it's really all a class issue. And part of what he does is he takes the fact that black people are largely in poverty and he puts that with, uh, into a, an argument without any context of why they are largely in that poverty just to justify uh, a socialistic perspective. Now, when you take into context why black people are largely in poverty, you have to look at the government's actions in sabotaging black efforts to succeed. And if you are looking at that, then ultimately you're going to have to draw a conclusion that uh, maybe the government needs to do something for black people to make up for what it did to harm black people. But Reed does not want to have that discussion. He wants to sidestep that discussion. So it's very easy for him to repackage uh, issues about black people paying their mortgage or rent into just a neat little class warfare scenario. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and among the ways that, uh, the, that the class divides are consequential are, for instance, um, the current um, up, obsession with the New Deal as racist, right? And with the idea of that universal programs Right, are um, fundamentally racist because they don't target black people in, in particular. No, Adolf Reed, the argument is that universal policies don't address the disparities. And black people don't get anything out of it. Um, so, so, but the fact of the matter is that black people got a lot out of the GI Bill. Black Our guest at the beginning of the show, you know, I pointed out that, that, uh, Ferguson and many other black enclaves are a poor and b black in part because of the way the GI Bill was administered. And and he said, "Well, give me some numbers to prove that." And I didn't have them at my fingertips, so here they are. <laughs> the GI Bill, uh, first of all, it was ninety-five billion dollars worth of programs, which is you know. A fair amount of money. I mean, it's it's a it's less than a tenth of what George Bush spent in Iraq, but it's still a hell of a lot of money. Uh, Sixteen million veterans attended college or bought homes or received job training as a result of the GI Bill. Uh, Bill Clinton once called it the best deal ever made by Uncle Sam. However, uh, the congressional leaders, when they wrote the GI Bill. They made sure that the money, the money didn't come, like when my dad, for example, used the GI Bill to buy a, a, house, a house in Lansing, Michigan. My dad was part of the uh, occupation of Japan after World War II, but when he joined and went through basic training, the war was still going on. And so he qualified for the GI Bill. And when dad did that, the money, it wasn't like Washington, D.C. wrote a check or backstopped the loan that my dad got for that house. Instead, or for that matter, when my dad went to college, the money was given to the state of Michigan and state officials administered the funds. So as a, a historian by the name of Katz Nelson uh, writes, written under, um, in quote, written under Southern auspices, the law was deliberately designed to accommodate Jim Crow. It was as though the GI Bill had been earmarked for white veterans only. Southern congressional leaders made certain that the programs were directed not by Washington, but by local white officials, businessmen, bankers, and college administrators who would honor past practices. So, numbers. Our guest was saying, give me numbers. Let's just take a look at the state of Mississippi, for example, in one year, 1947. There were 3,229 loans to purchase a home, a business, or a farm under the GI Bill in Mississippi in 1947, 3,229. How many went to black veterans? Two. There's your numbers. 
uh, and that racial disparity uh, isn't in the distribution of uh, of, of uh, you know, benefits and bad, you know, good things and bad things uh, isn't necessarily like the end of the story, right? There's a lot more more that's at stake. Um, it's, uh, it's captured in the phrase that Tanaishi Coates in his recent book and, and before that James Baldwin, those who would be white, they create a notion of a sanctuary yes. where you're not subject in a fantasy life yeah. to those deprivations and the anxieties of the prospect of those deprivations. Well, I think he calls them the dreamers. Yes. And, and he right. does that because they are constructing a fantasy. Yes. And that fantasy makes it extremely difficult for to, us to address our most pressing social problems. Yes. Now, when we look at the evidence across the spectrum, education, health, employment, housing, housing finance, mm -hmm. ownership, entrepreneurship. We don't see something like traditional economic theory where you and I were educated, which is what I call a whiteboard and a just world outcome based only on your talent, your ability, your preparation, your stamina. Right. You see outcomes that are systematically detrimental yeah, the African so, American population. So, so uh, you you may have seen this report already that uh, uh, a team of us did, including Derek Hamilton at the New mm -hmm. School, called "Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain." Yes, uh, I think that that report encapsulates the, uh, the 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 false narrative that has emerged out of much of traditional economics. Uh, because one of the standard kinds of claims that emerges from traditional economics is the view that uh, if we could improve the human capital of the group that has less, which usually means raising their educational attainment, uh, then we can eliminate or close these kinds of gaps or disparities that mm -hmm. we observe that are economic in character. Uh, but in Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain, we demonstrate, for example, that uh, blacks who have completed a college degree have two-thirds of the net worth of whites who never finished high school. Yes. Uh, so it's, 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 it's transparent that additional education is not adequate to close the racial wealth gap. Uh, but moreover, if we compare blacks who have finished some college with whites who never finished high school, blacks who have finished some college have a higher unemployment rate than whites who dropped out of high school. Um, and, and to compound that, uh, if we look at unemployment rates at each level of education, blacks consistently have unemployment rates that are two times as high as whites. Mm -hmm. So there is not a payoff, in, an adequate payoff in terms of uh, improved employment opportunities that are that's associated with additional education sufficient to close those gaps either. So uh, these disparities have to be rooted in other kinds of practices and I would say that one of the central ones is uh, is discrimination in employment and then another major factor is the whole process of how we transfer wealth from one generation to the next through inheritances, through gifts and the like. Uh, communities that have families that have more resources are better able to transfer those resources to the next the next generation, and this uh, this applies in, this applies fully or strongly when we start thinking about racial inequality with respect to wealth, mm -hmm. uh, because black families on average have considerably less to be able to give to the next generation in the yeah. way of inheritances or gifts. Uh, but. Um, 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 this notion that Medicare for all, right, like a single payer healthcare system wouldn't do anything for black people because it's not race targeted. The idea that free public college wouldn't do anything for black people because it's not race, race targeted. No, that's not the argument. Um, the argument is that if there's a racial disparity, doing a universal policy will not address that racial disparity. So if black people are largely on the bottom of every statistic that's, that there is, okay, now that you give me free health care, I'm still on the bottom, 
Now I just have health care. If you give me free education, I'm still on the bottom. Now I just have an education. But in every other way, I'm on the bottom. So, like, if we're talking about a disparity between races, and you're talking about a solution that will essentially change the bottom for everyone, all you're doing is adding a level of comfort to the bottom. But you're not actually moving black people who are at the bottom rung of this, of this society from that bottom rung to another rung. And that's what we're looking for. That's what we're trying to achieve because we're in this situation largely because we had a government that was sabotaging us. So our politics is going to revolve around trying to get the government to fix what it has done. If you want to ignore what the government has done, what exactly makes you different than a conservative on the right? Let's 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 be honest. If you are, have the same conclusion as the people that you tell me are my enemies, then how the fuck do I see you as a friend? And I mean, so and and, and of course, free college. I mean, we've had uh, uh, our one of our, our our financial editor, Sparky Abraham, has written mm -hmm. about the way that um, student debt, because student debt is disproportionately held right. by people right. of color, right. uh, free college actually right. is something that disproportionately benefits right. uh, no, no, people no, of color totally. because they're the ones that are screwed over most right. by our, right. uh, the, the way we finance uh, college. Let's talk about this hustle stat real quick. When someone is talking to you about something so broad, like a universal program, but they're coming back to you with the benefits of something that is so specific to your issue, you have to wonder, what aren't they telling you? So why are we talking about debt? Now, I get why we, why we would talk about debt in certain discussions, but if we're talking about universal free college, then that is not necessarily the only discussion to be had. We would also have to talk about people who aren't necessarily in poverty, who won't have to pay for college anymore. You know, people who do have wealth. And if we're not eating into their wealth with an expense like college, that means they'll be more likely to have that wealth at the end of their four years, eight years, or whatever, how many ever years. <clears throat> Now, we can debate whether or not there's a, an element of fairness in making people pay if they can pay or if they have the wealth to pay, I should say. But to me, that is ir irrelevant in describing a situation when we're trying to deal with a disparity. And this is a, 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 a solution that they use to deal with the disparity. So we have to be honest about what this will do if we're just talking about free college for everyone this will benefit white people more just by looking at the percentage of people that are going to college but you wouldn't know that if we only limited the discussion down to debt like this is the trick that they're pulling and i was kind of blown away um to get back and find out that the reparations issue had popped up and, and had gone live and was all over C-SPAN and everything. I couldn't figure out where it came from. Of course, he's not happy about reparations popping up in the news. And I couldn't, um, I couldn't figure out what was going on seeing like um, you know, respectable professors on, on a judicious panels talking about this issue. Because my question was always, first question I said this to Kianga too, has always been the same and I've never gotten gotten what I think is a satisfactory attempt to answer it even, okay. right? Which is, how can you imagine in a majoritarian democracy putting together a political alliance that's capable of prevailing on an issue like this that nobody gets anything out of except black people? All right, Adolf Reed, here's the argument. There are less than 15 million union workers in the United States of America. There are 70,000 
DSA members. I don't see where you guys find the numbers to push your agenda. And when I look at the political history of the Socialist Party in the United States of America, it's a fucking joke. Right now, we have seen the farthest that uh, a socialist has gone in the example of Bernie Sanders. And he was defeated twice because of the black vote. There are 30... Six million African Americans in this country that descend from American chattel slavery. If union workers, if the working class, if all these people that you think are in this thing of solidarity together could come together and push this thing so that black people in this country that descend from American bondage can have justice you will always find support for lefty policies in the black vote and that's even before all of the other questions like what counts as reparations I mean who who gets what I mean should 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 the ADOS uh, you know the American descendants of slaves line be be uh, followed okay um you are familiar with ADOS's uh language as far as eligibility is concerned and I agree with it I, I think it's the most logical um, qualifications that I've seen um, if, if you have any disagreement with that you probably should have let that be known um, otherwise uh, I think we should defer to Dr. William Darity he is an economist who has um, basically been studying this issue um, for decades and he wrote a book about how he wrote a book uh, basically about the history of reparations, the justifications, the reasons why, and how it can be done. Um, I do think that just from a pragmatic political point of view, the pragmatic political question trumps it, right? Uh, and I know the response has always been, well, but don't you think black people deserve something? And I said, well, yeah, of course, Like, but that's not the issue, right? The issue is, what is possible to win and how you can win it. But it even gets more, and maybe we can pursue this, but I think that's also fundamentally more of a class program than it is a, a racial program. Ah, uh, yes. Where will we be without a pivot to class? But I wonder, what happens if you don't give in and you just argue some more with Adolf Reed? Well, can, can I ask you, though, mm -hmm. uh, what... You think because it strikes me that a lot of the things that we demand on the left are mm -hmm. radical and require right. shifting right. public consciousness, and right. often at the beginning are things that we can't imagine, or it's very difficult to imagine happening. And 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 the fact that the majority may be against you means that you have to work really really hard, and it's a long right. slow process. Right. Um, but that if that's what would constitute justice. Um, it's sort of necessary because, I mean, there are lots of things that um, majorities oppose, but we believe in protecting sure. the minorities. So how, sure. do you, how do you think okay. about things that are sort of practical mm -hmm. utopianism versus right. things that are utopian right. utopianism? Yeah, uh, but yeah, I hear you. And in fact, like to go back to the Marty Moss Cohen show, uh, I mean, Kianga brought up um, you know, the case of abolitionism. But, and that's a nice case because like it shows the problem with, with the argument um, that um, abolitionism didn't get anywhere really um, except to piss off the slaveholders un, until um, um, political circumstances shifted to, um, to, to ad advance um, you know, the, the position of, of political anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. All right, to be clear, the question was, should we fight for reparations since it is the right thing to do as far as uh, giving black people justice in this country? And did you see how he he really didn't disprove the scenario that he was trying to use as, I mean, his his point 
like okay so you're saying that they didn't get anywhere until the political situation changed for the political situation to change there already has to be an anti-slavery sentiment that people can grasp onto and that's why there needs to be a movement fighting for reparations for so that people have something to grasp onto Otherwise, you're just giving me a circular argument that doesn't really go anywhere. So why should I accept that? I mean, that's do you think do you think there are ever uh, issues that where you just have to say, well, I mean, is it ever possible to mobilize around something that is not in the self-interest of the, I mean, we don't want to always have to appeal to self-interest. There are things where we're going to have to pursue things where people are going to have to give something up or. Well, look, I mean, my take on this is that, um, so like I read Aesop's fables a lot when I was mm -hmm. a little kid and, and my favorite one, well, one of my favorite ones was the one about the contest um, you know, between the wind and, and the sun. Uh, and uh, they were boasting back and forth at each other and they determined to test their prowess against um, a wayfarer um, who, 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 who was walking along the road and whichever one could get him to take his coat off uh, would, would be the more powerful. So the wind blew and blew and blew and and uh, no matter how much harder the wind blew, like um, I mean, the traveler just kind of pulled his, his his coat more more and more tightly around himself. And then when the sun took its turn, right, it just sort of uh, began to radiate uh, more and more warmth. And the traveler uh, eventually took the coat off on his own. Uh, my approach to politics, and this goes back to the question mm. of what counts as a movement mm. and and what doesn't. Is, um, is the project of trying to fasten a broad-based political alliance in which different people and constituencies can not only see a, a vehicle for pursuing their, their own interests, but can come to understand that um, a condition for, for advancement of their own interests is equal commitment to advancement of their partner's interests. Cool story, bro. Um, you've been in this like what thirty years? Where is your uh broad based alliance? I do not see it anywhere. And yes, he did just explain that he bases his political philosophy on a fairy tale. Does that mean that the black white wealth gap is sort of? In inevitable then or is there something that can address that particular like well yeah and that's a good question too um, I just saw a recent study by um, a guy named Alaprantis and his colleagues that argues in a seemingly per persuasive way that actually the root of the wealth gap is fundamentally the income gap okay so I've actually been trying to find this study that he's mentioning um, uh, it's obviously hard because he doesn't name the actual study. He doesn't even name uh, colleagues of Alaprancis. So I can't find this study, but I would love to to read it because it, it seems very odd to me that someone would, would make a claim like that, especially since the wealth gap is significantly more than the income gap. So this is not just, it's not just, it, it, it doesn't add up. So it doesn't make sense to me. Right, and uh, what's interesting about that is, it is that, um, well, in the first place, like the argument seems seems plausible although i'm having difficulty reconstructing it in in, yeah. in in my head off the top of my head um this part is kind of important if you're going to cite a study you kind of need to like if you're not if you don't know the name of the study at least know what they are arguing like what <laughs> okay so this is his level of argumentation under pressure. Like this is this is what he brings to the table to kind of 
like all right if you're tell if you're trying to sell me socialism on the idea that it's about justice it's about inequality and then when i bring to you especially an issue like reparations that is about workers being paid and like one of the greatest injustices around labor that has happened in america and this is the level of argumentation that you're giving me maybe you don't take it seriously maybe the marxist rhetoric is just a lot of bullshit uh, i don't know but this comes across like you're only talking to white workers because i don't understand how you frame it in your mind that you're actually giving black people an argument that we can agree with and find solidarity in had had now but they purport to show through experiments that if you close the income gap uh substantially right like at any given point then the wealth gap that would take 500 years to close can be closed in like 30 right as far as this concept of uh we can reduce it from 500 to 30 years that that seems ridiculous but the question then becomes why would we accept a gap that would take 30 years to close shouldn't we solve that problem also like just get it out the way mm -hmm. now that now the Alaprantis study has been met with um, I wouldn't say a firestorm because yeah. there are no weapons right for the firestorm, but uh, circumspection because you know for predictable reasons. One of them is that people who study the wealth gap are committed to the wealth gap being causally meaningful. That's right. He cannot um, describe the argument that he is making. Or that he is backing, but he is already poisoning the well for any critiques that you might find on this study that he didn't even name. Um, so, like, and just as academics, but I mean, also, uh, you, you know, there's there's an embedded um, ideological vision that's sort of smuggled in into the wealth gap construct, right? Like in this sense, um, what what what's the big penalty that that comes from the wealth gap right oh shit tread lightly brother don't go completely mask off the big penalty comes from uh, limits of capital formation mm -hmm. right and rich black people talk about this all the time um well okay so then what would capital formation do well cap capital or, or um more um repaired access to capital right um comports with with a political ideal of um of, of um strict equality real equality of opportunity being like the the mm -hmm. the fundamental mm -hmm. norm of social justice right um it might allow black people to participate in capitalism as capitalists which is a problem for the Adolf Reed types. Uh, they they don't want us to do that. They want us to embrace socialism. And I have no problem with uh, black people who want to uh, dabble in that ideology. Um, but we got to be real here. Um, you are offering me a theory my real life is fucked up and you're not even offering fix my situation in exchange for what you want to do what you're offering is that in the hopes of you succeeding at what you're you're doing that my situation would get better not fixed but better yeah, we are looking for fixes, and your ideology is at odds with that. Just say that.
not and and it's like this difference that that my good friend Preston Smith has has you know, harped on for a, a while now. There's a difference between the principles of a racial democracy and the principles of social democracy that 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 existed at a, um, at a in, in a state of de facto tension, right, in uh, you know, black politics from the 30s through the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s. Uh, and I think kind of what we have here is like a conflict between two different ideals of social justice and two different ideals of social justice for black people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one of which uh, hinges on, on um, overcoming unjust Im Im impediments to upward mobility um, w uh, you know, within uh, American neoliberal capitalism and the other of which is frankly socialist. Overcoming unjust Im Im impediments to upward mobility and the other of which is frankly socialist. That is him clearly stating that he is in opposition to any justice for black people that is not within the framework of socialism. But there's an interesting thing about people like Adolf Reed. They, they tell on themselves. So let's double back real quick to a moment that I kind of skipped over because I wanted to make a more uh, direct point about reparations. Right. Uh, so from that perspective, mm -hmm. um, and like this, th this also connects with one of the sort of um, standard, almost pro forma beefs that I have about what's what's called identity politics, which is that I I just don't understand. I've said this for more than thirty years too. How we build solidarity by going around the room to stress of how profoundly we actually differ from from one another. Just now, mind you, he reduces um, black issues down to identity politics, which also means in his mind tokenism. So this is this is this is in the middle of him answering the question about reparations. But I think it's, it's interesting that he felt so adamant about um people distinguishing themselves in the group when he's talking about an issue in regards to uh, benefiting black people. But he felt differently or he had a different perspective about this type of thing in this other clip. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions. But I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump and you ain't black, um, it, well, it's Biden, right? I mean, he's, it's, it's part and parcel of his, you know, working class, every man, friend, friend of MBNA image. So all this talk about solidarity with the working class, and this is what is going on in his mind, Adolf Reed's mind, when he thinks about the working man image. This is this is this is the this is how the working man thinks, according to Adolf Reed, and this is who we should have solidarity with. We can't bring up our differences in the meeting, but apparently we aren't black if we don't support them. Now look at our brother Adolf Reed, the man who has never met a class reductionist, does has no clue where these people could be. Watch him downplay the black vote. Hit you with some mumble jumbo, and then twist this right back into a class discussion. Uh, or that he's cultivated uh, is consistent with with his entire record and self presentation, especially uh, during the 2020 primaries. I mean, look, the problem with taking the something called the black vote for granted is, first of all, the notion of the black vote, right? Uh, because the the idea of the black vote is really the um, expression of a sort of calcified interest group politics agenda that's very sharply class skewed. Class skewed. Class, 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 class skewed. I'm, 
I'm sure it's not a hundred percent a myth, as uh, Cicero uh, said. I don't know. That's the most pretentious possible way to start a sentence. But as Cicero said, there's no view so absurd it has not been advocated by some philosopher. So I'm sure you can find somebody to point me to who's a real serious, genuine class reductionist. But Adolf Reed, as I think that makes clear, is certainly not a class reductionist. So why were people accusing him of this? Well, um, part of it has to do with a larger strategic difference between uh, how the sorts of demands that Reed thinks that the left should focus on uh, and, um, and, and try to reach out to people with versus you know, what some other people think. And part of it has to do with the specific subject of the lecture that he was going to give. So this lecture uh, was about the COVID pandemic, uh, and racial disparity ideology. So uh, if you want to know uh, what that means, uh, you can uh, you can find, so this is Adolf Reed, Disparity Ideology, Coronavirus, and the Danger of the Return of Racial Medicine, uh, where he's talking about a couple of related things. One of them is the emphasis, I mean, the overall, the overarching subject is the way that a lot of... Um, liberal or even leftist, you know, social democratic politicians have been really emphasizing um, the racial disparities in COVID deaths that, you know, black people, brown people are vastly more likely to die of COVID than, than white people. Um, and, and that's true and important. Uh, but uh, Reed is, of course, not denying uh, that it's true or important or disturbing. Um, you know, Reed has been spending his entire life uh, as a critic of racism and capitalism. Uh, so obviously he's not going to say that. This has been Burgess. He's a logic professor and he's also a YouTube lefty. But most importantly, he is full of shit. You need to go read this article by Adolf Reed. Reed is not only denying that more black people are dying, He's denying the importance of looking into a racial disparity. What he is saying uh, is that front-loading the racial disparity per se and not really talking about the mechanism uh, is dangerous, he thinks, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it might give people the impression uh, that this is some sort of, you know, there's, there's some sort of genetic explanation for these disparities. Uh, which, of course, would be, um, you know, that's what he means when he talks about the return of racial medicine. Uh, and, of course, his point there is that since race uh, is silly, made-up bullshit, uh, that, you know, that's, it's, it's not a meaningful, natural, genetic category, it's a social construction, um, then it's, uh, then, you know, so we want to look elsewhere for the cause of these disparities. Well, what's the cause of these disparities? The cause of these disparities, as he points out, is very simple, right? Uh, that certainly, you know, there might be other exacerbating factors that, that cause the disparities, but the overwhelming factor is that due to the horrifying racial history of the United States, uh, black and brown people are more likely to live in poverty. Reed makes absolutely no connection in that article between the racial history of America and the poverty that black people face today. In fact, what he does in that article is kind of deny that there is a racial element at all because he, he implies that racism was essentially fixed with the social movements of the 60s. Due to the horrifying racial history of the United States, uh, black and brown people are more likely to live in poverty than uh, white people. Um, so, and this statistical fact in turn drives the ones uh, about, about COVID deaths because there are all sorts of ways uh, in which living in poverty uh, makes you more likely to uh, be vulnerable uh, to this, um, ranging from you don't have the kind of job where you can work from home uh, to um, healthcare access, to, you know, et cetera, right? All right, so uh, the other reason he thinks that it's important to emphasize um, the poverty causing uh, disproportionate deaths 
uh, rather than emphasizing the racial distribution of the deaths, uh, which which can sort of mask the fact that the underlying issue is the racial distribution of poverty. All right, several times I asked you to go to this Adolf Reed article, and what I want you to do is click on this link to this uh, this other article that he's actually referencing as far as a reason for his article. Um, the problem here is that Adolf Reed is so against acknowledging a racial disparity that he has he is way beyond the point of straw manning his opposition what reed is doing now is straight up conspiracy theory and it is sad to see anyone try to defend this man at this point in time because you can click on this article read through it and see it is nothing like how he describes it he is he is saying that democratic leaders academics reporters medical professionals were asking for information on a racial disparity for this COVID thing because they secretly believe in some type of eugenic type of mindset when in reality people were bringing this up because of the existing racial disparities in healthcare like they were bringing it up because they already knew the limited access that black people have to health care they already knew the higher level of pre-existing conditions that exist among black people they they were bringing this stuff up because they knew about the racial wealth gap and they knew about the de facto segregation that was going on in these communities that's not something that can be explained away through poverty you can't see that through poverty this is something that reed will not address he only wants to see things through the lens of poverty he only wants to see things through the lens of class so he took something that was perfectly reasonable and he made a monster out of it um i think they're basically a debater's trick Right, and, mm. and it's one that's common enough, like in academic life, as as well as elsewhere. Uh, you attribute to uh, an unnamed opponent an extreme stance that no actual people take, and then you tear down uh, substantive um, arguments by linking them to this um, extreme fiction that 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 you've posited, but that nobody really em embraces. I mean. Can you explain the actual point and why uh, this this narrow emphasis on just racial disparities over uh, potentially has certain pitfalls uh, mm -hmm. as it relates to uh, COVID related deaths and actually might hurt us in the attempt to to actually undermine the disparities that that is you know leading to to the deaths uh, disproportionately of, of many many uh, poor people and many of black and brown. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll well, um, I'll try to be concise about this. I mean, the, um, the problem is that racism doesn't explain anything, right? This is Reed. Months later, after statistics from all over the country have proven him wrong about there being a racial disparity in the COVID infections, two months from his article. Enough time for him and his supporters to go back and read past the headlines of all those articles that he referenced in his little article. You know, all those articles that supposedly caused the alarm to begin with. You can read those articles and see that all of it is bullshit. And it's it's fucking sad that he is given a platform where he can he can downplay racism and then push a conspiracy theory just so he can derail any type of like discussion about race it's a label 
that we put on to com more complex dynamics and processes of exploitation and, and, and oppression. But racism itself, or the charge of racism itself should always be followed by, when I say this is an instance of racism, I mean these, these features of it uh, show racist dispositions, attitudes, the impact of racist structures or whatever. And that's exactly what people did in all of those articles. Um, but so what's happened with disparity discourse, and for some time now, because uh, the Merlin Chalquanian and I did an article in uh, the Socialist Register on the limits of disparities discourse eight, eight years ago, for God's sake. Um, pointing to disparities doesn't explain anything, right? Like it doesn't, it's an alternative to a causal account, right? Because you say, see, disparity, racism, but you, but you don't have a causal account of how the inequalities are produced, right? So that's one problem. Right, like it doesn't help you get anywhere. Is that problem? Um, the causal account is centuries of discriminatory laws that has created a racial wealth gap and has created a situation where black people have less access to health care because of that gap. And in every article, you could see people explaining this over and over and over again but adolf reed is pretending that that part does not exist because that part disproves everything he's trying to do another problem is that and we've seen this already now i mean this time around that the ways that people talk about race in this country and wherever they talk about it are so hopelessly confused and knee jerk and abstract and you know in and and incoherent that when you say um, I mean you and I can say that race matters. Charles Murray can say that race matters, and I assume you and I aren't going to mean the same thing that Charles Murray means, but there are enough. Charles Murray types out there, even who don't think of themselves as Charles Murray types. Who is Adolf Reed talking about? Because if you look at his article, he's pointing to people like Elizabeth Warren. He's pointing to AOC. He's pointing to uh, Charles Blow from the New York Times. And, and, and like who, who now he's saying that they are they think of this. They think of race in the same way that Charles Murray thinks of race. Like who, how are y'all falling for this scam? Who would think, who have already indicated that the persistent and what seem to be large, although as the total cases go up, the disparities can, can flatten out, um, disparate in, impact on black and brown people with respect to the bad outcomes or the worst out, outcomes from COVID-19 infection are signs of our evidence or stem from differential racial biology. So that's one problem, right? Who the fuck is he talking about? That's lurking there. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a, a biological metaphor. Yes, I mean, when the biological metaphor is invoked, right, I and, uh, and I assume a lot of the rest of us um, you know, think about that cattle train that ends up at Auschwitz, right? Because because that's where that narrative always goes. Uh yes, this is Alex Jones level. We went from politicians, journalists, academics requesting data on racial disparities, and now he is making them out to be like some type of Nazis who are going to lead us to a Holocaust. Um, but um, but it can also be cultural, right? Because race wasn't, uh, um, uh, I mean, race is always, well, race can't denote anything that's empirically real because the concept is an abstraction, like it's not real. I mean, I like the way that, that my son, the birthday boy did this 
in his last piece in uh, in um, in uh, I mean Jacobin, where where he invoked Christianity, he said, "Look, Christians believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Jesus Christ doesn't have to be the literal Son of God for Christianity to be real and have force in the world, uh, right? Even not." taking into account all the billions of Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and whatever the hell else who, who don't embrace the belief that Jesus is the son of God, right? But racism, race exists because of racism, right? As, as Anna Barbara Fields has argued also. Uh, it's it's um, a cover story, right? Um, to uh, sustain um, a particular technology of hierarchy, right? Exploitation and, and oppression. So it's not really dependent on biology in the way that people like to think it is. And in fact, part of the story of post-war American ideology uh, and the crafting of uh, post-war liberalism and the social sciences is that the Holocaust in particular um, had um, made the notion of biological race um, uh, uh, had put heavy negative sanctions on it, like at least outside the South in the U.S. Yes, the racial hierarchy. Anyways, um, you notice how he constantly makes like these go nowhere points. Like, what was the point about the about race and Christianity? Like, OK, yeah, we get it. It's it, like race is a social construct, but we live in a society that acknowledges race. So let's 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 deal with the reality of the society that we live in and stop playing games. Um, so. So the effective race idea moves moves from biology to culture. And in this context, then, it's the easiest thing in the world, and I think we have both, and we aren't alone in having done so, we have both seen articles asserting softer or stronger versions of this claim that Blacks and Latinos are more likely to suffer the consequences because they're more likely to help have have the underlying co comorbidity conditions, and they're more likely to have those because of their shitty habits, right, with eating and 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 and, and whatnot, and therefore focusing on the racial disparity doesn't even get people to where they think it's going to get them. Right? Who is Adolf Reed talking about? What is Adolf Reed talking about? I think you should be able to see the point. But he is going to use this imaginary enemy and I mean, well, you're going to see he goes full mask off. Right. And one question that I would have to ask at this point, I mean, we already were asking it eight years ago. If the, if the focus on racial disparity has been so unsuccessful in getting people who, who, who are purportedly committed to social change, where they want to go, what's so sweet about continuing to focus on the racial disparity? What's so sweet about continuing to focus on the racial disparity? Racial disparity. What does it do for you uh, that's satisfactory other than a sense it doesn't get you to where it is you're trying to go? 